Traditionally on Palm Sunday, the congregation gathers together with uh, palm fronds to celebrate and recognize the time of Jesus entering the holy city of Jerusalem. Uh, this year, we can't gather all together, but we still wanted to do the procession, that remembrance of Jesus coming into the city, um, as, well, uh, as well as um, the trek that the Hebrews had through the wilderness. Uh, it really is reminiscent of both. So with the few cars in the background, uh, we'll do the Liturgy of the Palms. You can find this on our website uh, if you want to follow along uh, on Sunday morning. Bless is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace, Peace in, in heaven, heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This is a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning at the first verse. When Jesus and his disciples had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It is right to give, it, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thank, God thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches... Let's do this again. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our king, and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As we process to the church, we will say in unison Psalm 118, verses 1 and 2, and 19 through 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim, his mercy endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them, I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. 
I will give thanks to you for you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. Lord, send us now success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. He has shined upon us. Form a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ, amen. Also my throat and my belly. 
for my life is wasted with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and in your loving kindness, save me. The epistle from this morning comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And if you'd like to follow along with that one, you can find that in the New Testament on page 197. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Service continues with him 168. Christ according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed, 
and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then will the scriptures be fulfilled? which say it must happen in this way. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, 
Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, a servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you were also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What, what is that, that to us? us? See to it yourself. yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. 
Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, If he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's Son. 
The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice, and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it on his, in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, Sir we remember what the, the imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. This is the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Palm Sunday is uh, one of the most unusual Sundays of the church year in that we try to squeeze together a whole week of activity of Jesus and his disciples. We have to remember that as Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem, the city was not uh, just filled with the normal citizens that live in, in, in Jerusalem. He came there during the time of the Passover. Jews from all over the known world had come back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, in order to celebrate the Passover, that pivotal moment in the history of the Jews that moment when they gained an identity 
when the Lord had come to them in Egypt as slaves and he performed mighty acts in order that Pharaoh would allow the Hebrew slaves to go free, to be led into the wilderness and on to the promised land by Moses and God. And so the city was filled with people. They were remembering who they were and they were celebrating what might be. It was a pivotal moment for them. What they didn't know and what we can see from this side of Jesus' passion and resurrection, that it was another pivotal moment for the Jews and for all. It was the time when Jesus would complete his earthly ministry. It was the time when he would be obedient to God, even to the passion, the suffering on the cross, and to death itself. We hear the cries of Hosanna turn to cries of crucify him. And if you look and read the lessons assigned for this Holy Week, you will see that he will take each step closer and closer to fulfilling his role as the Messiah, the Christ. And in fulfilling that, giving us a new pivotal moment, a turning point in the life of those who believe and those who follow God. It was an opportunity for the Jews to see and receive their Messiah, the Christ. And as we know, some did, many did not. It was a time when they were still searching, a time when they were trying to understand, a time when they were trying to make sense out of all that was going on in the world around them, especially as Jesus has been teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God, performing mighty acts of healing. Must have seemed to many of them, most of them, perhaps all of them, that the death of Jesus on the cross negated his claim to be the Messiah. It wasn't until Sunday, the day of the resurrection, that his role was completed, the promise was fulfilled. Those who could see and could receive and understand found and understood a new way of living and relationship with God. It was that pivotal moment, that moment of turning. And we are the church that follows that moment. As I was thinking about this in this particular time, when I'm standing in front of a camera and three lovely ladies of the congregation and seeing the rest of the church open, empty. It made me think that we are in the midst of a pivotal moment. That time of discerning, that time of, of looking, trying to understand what's going on in our lives. What is God doing now in the world? Certainly, I do not believe that God sent a pandemic into the world. That's not the theology that I follow. I do believe that we have a unique opportunity to look at what is going on in the lives of the church, in the lives of so many of us as we are searching for God and we have taken on new roles. We have taken on new disciplines. So many times now people are getting on their social media not to see a, another movie or another comical uh, video, but to participate in daily prayer, to celebrate church together, 
to recognize that there's so much more that we can do as a church when we are not able to gather physically together. I was on a telephone conversation with our bishop yesterday and we were discussing this very thing. And he said that when he was on a, a Zoom meeting with some of the other bishops, they were also talking about the fact that more people were doing the daily office now in the last few days and would continue to do so through the next 30 days or more than possibly had been done in the last 300 years. I think that might be a bit of a stretch. But when we find our, ourselves in times of questioning, we turn more and more to God. And we are lucky to have the technology now to gather together virtually when we cannot gather together physically. This is a good thing. It is good for us to remember that we as families can gather together on our own and use our Book of Common Prayer to have morning prayer, noonday prayers, evening prayer, Compline. It's also a good reminder that we are always in God's hands, that this time is truly no different than any other. And even though now we are turning to God more because of the pandemic, I think it should be a reminder to us also that we need to remember that we are in God's hands always, that it doesn't require an emergency for us to take time for God, to pray for one another, to lift up those who, not just during pandemics, but every day of their lives are going into hospitals to take care of those who are sick and dying. This is an opportunity to remember who we are, that we are in the hands of God, and that we have received so many blessings. We have the opportunity to be with family. We should not take that for granted. And, and this has been a learning experience, a lesson for us to remember that the family and friends that we have in our lives, the church family that we belong to is a great gift from God. One not to be taken lightly, one to be celebrated daily. One of the questions that I had for myself and, and asked the bishop was, where will we go from here? When this is done, what will take place? What identity will we have as the church? What disciplines will we keep? Will we continue to gather as a family to pray together? Will we continue to meet together over long distances with those we love using the technology that we have at hand? Will we continue to video stream the services that we are doing so that those who are unable to come to be around their church family still has the opportunity to worship together, to be in communion together, even after all this is done. This is a pivotal moment. This is a time for us to discern, to ask the questions, but to remember also that this time will pass. What lessons will we take with us? What blessings will we take with us? We are in the hands of God, no more now than we were before, no more now than we will when this passes. May we take the lessons of this time, truly celebrate what God has done for us, 
the community that God has built for us. May we celebrate it and never again take it for granted. It's been a long time since I've done just the first part of the Eucharist service. Uh, it is allowable by the rubrics. I haven't done it since I was a deacon some 36 years ago um, because I couldn't do the rest of the service. But today we will just complete the service with the what's known as the Liturgy of the Word or the Anti-Communion. We will continue with the Nicene Creed. It's on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People, our Form 2, which can be found on page 385 of the Book of Common Prayer. We will also be using our bulletin insert, which can be found on the St. Jude's website. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout all the world, for our presiding bishop Michael, our bishop Russell, our rector Greg, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the de departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for members and friends of our congregation with special needs. Susan, Jerry, Jane, Judy, Anne, Mary Lee, Carol, Kim, Risa, Ginny, Charles and Mary, Renee, Carol, Jay, Nancy, Sarah, Chris, Nan, Mike, Nikki, Wanda, Barb, Terry, Ted, Thomas, Mike, Zach, Jeremy, Bobby Joe, Ray, Ted, Monica, Scott, Doris, Davey, Nyla, Craig, Bob, Kathy, 
Aiden. I ask for Thanksgiving for those celebrating birthdays, Deborah, Vera Mae, and Lucy. And we ask prayers for members and friends deployed by the military, Jonathan, Howard, Matt, Michael, Emily, Terry, and chaplains who serve, and for the body life of St. Jude's, for each of us to invite someone to encounter Christ with us next Sunday. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The service continues as we say together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.